the lesson I learned in 2016 at the federal election was what um, really catalyzed the, the whole ministry. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about first tonight. Uh, and that is, don't lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. Sunday morning after the election in 2016, there was a church full of people that I was at, um, people who were conservative and, uh, you know, intelligent and, and really loved God. And I know because I was organising for a political party that year that very few of them were volunteering on election booths the day before, election day. And yet on Sunday morning, they had the audacity to raise their hands to heaven and ask God to deliver righteous government, which to me is like leaning on a shovel and praying for a hole. God's given you the tools. God's given us representative democracy. God has put it in our hands to change the outcomes of elections, along with unionists and environmentalists and feralists and other people which will definitely raise their voice. Right now, it's making headlines that Islamists are trying to have political influence in Australia. Well, welcome to Australia. That's your right. Why are we the last people to realise it? that the best outcome for this nation is when the people of God, the people of the book, the people of truth, the people of life, the people of love your neighbour and turn the other cheek, when we actually wield influence on election outcomes, righteousness results and exalts the nation. And so I've heard uh, lots of arguments um, about why we shouldn't um, get involved in politics, but I think the best argument for getting involved in politics was the parable of the Good Samaritan. When Jesus was illustrating how to love your neighbour, he didn't include prayer or uh, going to church uh, or anything spiritual and ritually religious. It was very practical. He said to love your neighbour, you have to uh, be ready to be interrupted by God. I promise you the Good Samaritan, who was the example of neighbourly love, was not in the ministry or profession of roadside assistance. <laughs> he was on a journey from A to B and he got interrupted. He allowed himself to be inconvenienced. So many people who are not here tonight are going to be saying, I'm not interested in politics. Well, allow yourself to be inconvenienced if you love your neighbour. Allow yourself to be interrupted once every three or four years. When we have an election, it's okay to be interrupted. You don't have to be called to it. But Jesus actually contrasted the Good Samaritan with the religious people who crossed to the other side of the road when the opportunity arose to make a difference in somebody's life. And in this state, there are millions of lives we can make a difference of with just one day's effort and, and a little bit of attention. Um, and so... He invested his time and his money, and he also took a long-term interest in the outcome of, of the, uh, the neighbour that he helped, the person who was beaten up on the side of the road. So good parable there, good parallel for uh, getting involved in politics. Obviously, that's not the primary meaning of Jesus' message, but it's certainly applicable. E excuses Christians might use. We're called to preach the gospel, not politics is the implication. I don't know how you can be in this society and not see that the politics of the nation contradicts the gospel every day, every headline, every news bulletin, every social media post, every, every time somebody changes their, their, uh, their profile picture um, to coincide with one particular agenda uh, that's very, very political. They are contradicting the gospel and the gospel says no. Actually, uh, you need to agree with God. Uh, the gospel confronts this culture in a major way. And if you're avoiding uh, politics, you are only preaching half the gospel. That's unavoidable. Um, another excuse is the Bible says to avoid politics. And that's simply not true. That's really misrepresenting what the Bible says a lot. Uh, one of the confusions people have is that Jesus was on a once-in-an-eternity mission, which would have been derailed by getting involved in domestic politics at that particular time. In fact, he made it a very big effort to avoid the Jews of that time 
trying to anoint him as king and overthrow the Roman Empire. Um, that was not his job then and there. But the job he came for, he very clearly said, it is finished. That was the redemption of man, the breaking of the curse, the atonement that only he could do. And at the same time, he spent his whole ministry confronting those in power over society who kept making legislation after legislation, hoarding and accumulating power for themselves, perverting justice and oppressing the most vulnerable in our society. That was politics. And there's so many more examples of that, but I, I want to keep moving because I could take the whole night just on don't lean on a shovel. Um, politics won't save Australia. Well, of course not. But then again, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the government will be upon his shoulder. These are all prophecies about Jesus, who will save Australia. Because the thing that saves political corruption is cultural integrity, cultural righteousness, cultural character and virtue. You don't even need to believe in the law of gravity to cooperate with it and benefit from it. And just so you don't need to believe in morality as coming from God to be moral, but that is where morality comes from. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the church must be reminded it is not the master or the servant of the state, but it is the conscience of the state. Every good government needs a good conscience. Every good politician needs a good conscience. And so it is the church's job not to think we control the state and certainly not to let the state control us, but to preach what is true and to preach what is good and to preach what is just. It's divisive. Well, welcome to Christianity. We've learned how to negotiate and debate and civilly and sincerely explore our differences and pursue truth in the church. In fact, the Holy Spirit deemed it uh, okay and beneficial to publish in the Bible the fact that the church was divided and had a dispute about a doctrine right at the beginning, with Peter taking one side on uh, needing to be really legalistic and obey Jewish ceremonial laws and Paul on the other side saying, no, they're, they're not saved for that anymore. And, and so we know from the very beginning, as old as the church is, we've always been able to uh, bridge division and explore things and seek God's mind on, on what to do. I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about preferences later. So... One of the most important things to know when I'm encouraging Christians to get involved in politics, when I'm encouraging pastors to start preaching uh, on the topics, the important public issues that your parishioners are hearing all day, every day from everybody else, and they're hearing the wrong thing, but they're things that God isn't silent on. And so why should the pulpit be silent on? The right answer on how to... Uh, approach this without being inappropriate or, or harmful to the church is don't be partisan. Be political, but not partisan. This is illustrated in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. Joshua is a military man. He, like every good soldier, has been trained to identify friend or foe when he comes across an uh, armed stranger away from the camp. And he says to this man who he sees with his sword drawn, that's like um, an Aussie soldier coming across somebody with the finger on the trigger in a different uniform, he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the man says, no, I'm the commander of the Lord's host. And then Joshua says what every pastor should say, what every Christian should say when it comes to an election time, when it comes to an election issue, what does my master want to say? What does Jesus want to say to Queensland in this election? What does Jesus want to say to Stephen Miles? What does Jesus want to say to David Crisofulli? What does Jesus want to say, our master, to the candidates in the electorate that we get to choose from? And that's your job. Dear candidate, will you stand for the sanctity of life? That's what Jesus wants to say. Now, 
I'm not going to presume the authority to tell you the definitive list of this election, but tonight the three of us have come together to actually suggest three of the biggest justice, moral issues and emergencies that are facing this state. Feel free to think some of them are less important than others. Feel free to think something's more important that's not on our list. But my plea to you is to do so with the question of what does my master say? What does the word of God say? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? As I spend time in prayer, where is he leading me to be concerned? What's breaking God's heart? That's the way we choose our votes. All right. Can everybody read that? I'm, I'm going to go through some of these uh, very quickly because this is to dispel the myth that there is uh, no politics in the Bible or in Christianity or in church or in the pulpit. Uh, Micah 6.8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord really wants from you. He wants you to carry out justice, to love faithfulness, to live obediently before your God. Jeremiah 22 verse 3, the Lord says, do what is just and right. Deliver those who have been robbed from those who oppress them. Do not exploit or mistreat resident foreigners who live in your land. Children who have no fathers or widows. We'll be talking about mistreating children tonight. Do not kill innocent people in this land. We'll be talking about killing innocent people in this state tonight. Amos 5.24. Justice must flow like torrents of water. Righteous actions like a stream that never dries up. God is interested in justice. Proverbs 31, 8 to 9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Matthew 23, 23, woe to you, parliamentarians, lawyers, hypocrites. You're so legalistic to give a tenth of your herbs, yet you neglect what is more important in the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have done these things without neglecting the others. Psalm 106 verse 3. How blessed are those who promote justice and do what is right all the time. Proverbs 28 verse 5. Evil people do not understand justice, which is why the church is the conscience of the state. But those who seek the Lord understand it all. Proverbs 29 verse 7, the righteous person cares for the legal rights of the poor. The wicked person does not understand such knowledge. Isaiah 58 verse 6 is talking about all the kinds of religious duties and fasts and demonstrations that the Jews were doing uh, at that time. But Isaiah in 58 verse 6 says no, on behalf of God saying, this is the kind of fast I want. I want you to remove the sinful chains to tear away the ropes of the burdensome yoke, to set free the oppressed and to break every burdensome yoke. We'll be talking about burdensome yokes tonight. And last one, Isaiah 59, 14 to 17. Our courts oppose the righteous and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets and honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. Amen. The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. Now, here's the impressive, amazing part. God was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained him. This is beautiful. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. God's calling the church in this generation to not keep dropping the ball, to not keep sleeping, to not keep sitting on the sidelines and bemoaning the darkness, but to put on our helmet of salvation, to take up our shield of righteousness and that cloak that he has of divine passion. What is God's divine passion for this election? It's not one party over the other. It's justice. It's righteousness. It's honesty. 
Uh, and that's the message you and everybody watching this video gets to take back to the state. Is It's this church's time to rise up and influence the outcome of this election with the same democratic invitation and opportunity that every other constituency in this state has and uses. Amen.